enjoy the intellectual stimulation of mathematics. I like to use that part of my brain. During those times in my life when I was not using that part of my brain, I felt as if something was missing. I took a number of mathematics classes when I was in high school. Unfortunately, I didn't get as far along as I could have. This was due in part to a bad junior high and also in part due to an honest air of my high school counselor. I attended a good junior high for the first part of the year. This was in West Des Moines, Iowa. There, I was taking pre-algebra. It was preparing me for advanced algebra my freshman year of high school. Then I transferred to Garrison Junior High in Garrison, South Dakota, a very small town. The school there really sucked. There were few courses offered. I suppose not that many people were college bound, so the school didn't need to have that much. There I had to take basic math. Worse yet, because of an error, when I had my teachers fill out a form listing grades, I got a bad grade. I was getting a B in pre-algebra, but the teacher mixed up the columns for initials and grades. In the column for initials, he put the grade. In the other column, he put the initial. Unfortunately, his initials were RC. Thus, the school thought I was getting a C in math. I tried to get the school to change it, but it didn't seem to work. I even resorted to calling the principal at home. started at Jefferson High School, my dad and I talked to my counselor about what classes I should take. I was college bound, so honors classes sounded like a good idea. Math and science were two areas of concern. Not because I had troubles in those areas, but because of my coursework in the past. I remember asking my counselor if I had troubles with advanced algebra, could I get out of it? She said no. So I took basic algebra. At my high school, basic algebra takes two years to complete the same material that is in advanced algebra. Advanced algebra takes one year to complete with that same material. Basic algebra went well for me, so the next year I took advanced algebra. The first year was essentially wasted. I also took geometry, 
computer programming and college algebra. I took honors chemistry and honors physics, which were heavily math based. I liked that part of those science classes. many other students debated what I wanted to major in. Before I went to college, it was going to be education, but soon that was discarded. Initially, I majored in political science, but I really didn't have a passion to major in that. Psychology and French were two majors I played around with. It looked like I was going in the liberal arts direction, so math wasn't something I was going to do much of. I ultimately double majored in sociology and philosophy. Although, although on first glance, these majors may not seem to be math related, each does have something that pertains to math. In philosophy, it's logic. Logic is just like geometry and computer program, which I took in high school. In sociology, you have statistics at all levels of sociology bachelor's, master's, and PhD, statistics are important, particularly if you are into quantitative research methods. Quantitative research methods are number crunching. Statistics is unlike what I did in high school, although there was some carryover. For example, odds and probability were part of statistics, which is also part of algebra. Toward the end of college, I got an urge to study trigonometry. I never got to study that in high school. In college, like I said, I wasn't studying math-related fields. In one Federation Without Television lecture, I even remarked that I wanted to study trigonometry to balance what I was doing in my other classes. Graduate school kept me busy. It was nice taking statistics that one semester because it balanced my other classes. Most of my other classes in graduate school were heavy textbook based classes. You did a lot of reading and then writing papers. After graduate school, I moved here and worked. My job here was not intellectually stimulated. I also had an urge to study Latin, so I did that. Later, I again felt an itch to study trigonometry. I knew that Latin was very time consuming, but still, I had this itch. I checked out a book. And eventually, I did study trigonometry. I'm ever so glad I started. It has been a very intellectually stimulating field of endeavor. I feel actualized because I have begun to study it. At first, it was strictly trigonometry. Later, it branched out to pre-calculus as well. Trigonometry is defined as the branch of mathematics that pertains to understanding the relationships of sides and angles of triangles. You may think, how in the world can a whole field of math pertain just to triangles? How? Actually, it's quite easy because 
There are so many different Precalculus, like its name suggests, involves concepts that prepare you for calculus. In precalculus, you study logarithms, functions, exponents, matrices, arithmetic sequences, geometric sequences, mathematical induction, permutations, combinations, conic sections, among other concepts. Some textbooks and some courses include trigonometry inside of precalculus. Trigonometry is considered a part of precalculus. At my high school, one semester was trigonometry, the other semester was precalculus. For a little over a quarter, I attended Lincoln High School in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. At the beginning of the year, the school had these skits. A lot of people thought they were hilarious. I thought they were pretty dumb and lowbrow. One skit involved glorifying seniors while scoffing at first year students. Besides the ages of, of this skit, it was inaccurate. The skit portrayed seniors as being really cool and sexual. The one main character talked about using whipped cream for sexual purposes. The freshman character talked about studying trigonometry. He had a stereotypical nerd look. This is so wrong. At my high school, the most advanced group of kids took trigonometry and precalculus their junior year. The next group behind them, college bound but not quite as advanced, took trigonometry their senior year. In maybe one case, I heard of an especially gifted student taking trigonometry his sophomore year. It's unheard of that someone would take it freshman year. It would be way hard to get all the previous math in by that time. If anyone in that skit would have been taking trigonometry, it would have been that senior character, not the freshman character. Trigonometry involves some of the same concepts of geometry. Degrees is one of the more basic geometric concepts. Degrees are used to measure angles. In trigonometry, angles are represented by big letters and sides of triangles are represented by small letters. There's another way of measuring angles. It's called radians. Degrees are generally big in number. For example, you may have 304 degrees. Radians are much smaller. They also include the symbol pi, which is a very important, if not the most important, mathematical symbol. Radians are numbers such as two-thirds pi, three-fourths pi, pi over two. Pi over two is equivalent to 90 degrees. Pi over three is equivalent to 60 degrees. Pi over four is equivalent to 45 degrees. Pi over six is equivalent to 30 degrees. Pi is equivalent to 180 degrees. There are some equations that enable you to convert between the two. Some problems ask for solutions in radian form, others ask for solutions in degrees form. What is the R over pi enables you to convert from radians to degrees. Pi D over 180 enables you to convert from degrees to radians. In 
trigonometry, there are some basic ratios known as the trigonometric ratios. These ratios, to me, are pretty simple to understand. In fact, I remember being introduced to them in college algebra. The most basic problems involving these ratios are pretty cut and dry. These ratios, even in the most simplest form, can be used to solve some word problems. One common word problem is figuring out how tall or how long a shadow is. The side ratio is equal to the opposite side of the angle in consideration over the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is the longest leg of a triangle. The cosine is equal to the adjacent side of that given angle over the hypotenuse. The tangent ratio, unlike the other two, does not involve the use of the hypotenuse. The tangent ratio is equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. These three ratios have reciprocal functions. These are ratios which involve inversing these three ratios that I just mentioned. For sine, you have cosecant. That is equal to the hypotenuse over the opposite side. For cosine, you have secant. That is equal to the hypotenuse over the adjacent side. For tangent, you have cotangent. That is equal to the adjacent side over the opposite side. As you may recall, when you multiply inverses by each other, they cancel each other out, or they equal one. One common type of problem in trigonometry is verified identities problems. At first these intimidated me, then I eventually gave them a world, and they weren't as bad as I made them out to be. They were challenging, surely, but I found some satisfaction in them. Some of the more difficult ones still are quite challenging. It helps to do it and then look at the solution, then you get some ideas that you can apply in the future. Verified identities is sometimes known as proving identities. What are identities? Identities are further relationships of these trigonometric ratios. You may square the ratios, you may square root them, you may multiply them, add them, divide them. Pythagorean identities are three of the most common. Sine squared a plus cosine squared a equals one. Tangent squared a plus one equals secant squared a. Cotangent squared a plus one equals cosecant squared a. You also have your quotient relations. Sine a over cosine a equals tangent a. Cosine a over sine a equals cotangent a. Double angle formulas are sine 2a equals 2 sine a, cosine a, cosine 2a equals cosine squared a minus sine squared a, or 2 cosine squared a minus 1, or 1 minus 2 sine squared a. Tangent 2a equals 2 tangent a over 1 minus tangent squared a. The squared formulas are sine squared a equals 1 half parenthesis 1 minus cosine 2a. Cosine squared a equals 1 half parenthesis 1 plus cosine 2a. There are a number of others. When you solve identity problems, unlike algebra, you don't manipulate both sides. You manipulate just one side. The aim is to get one side equal to the other side. It's like solving a puzzle to me. Another common type of problem in trigonometry is a problem type called solving triangles. 
you figure out parts of triangles in geometry, but this is pretty limited in contrast to what you do in trigonometry. In geometry, you may figure out the third angle when you have two angles. If you subtract two angles from 180 degrees, you get the third angle. If you have a right triangle, you can figure out the third side using the Pythagorean theorem. T squared equals A squared plus B squared. In trigonometry, when you solve triangles, you need to figure out all the parts of the triangle if that's possible. You may be given a combination of sides and angles for three sides. You need to figure out the angles as well. In order to figure out these problems, you use the law of sines and the law of cosines. The law of sines is small a over sine big A equals small b over sine big B equals small c over sine big C. The law of cosines is c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine big C. When you use which, if you have two sides and the angle between those two sides, you use the law of cosines. If you have two sides and an opposite angle, you use the law of sines. This is known as the ambiguous case. If you have three sides, you use the law of cosines. If you have two angles and one side, you use the law of sines. For the ambiguous case, there are a number of conditions that tell you how many solutions your problem has. Inverses are commonly used in trigonometry. Basic inverse problems are taught to you in algebra. For example, you realize that four-fifths when inverse is 5 or 4. In fact, this is even taught earlier than algebra in many cases. When you're dealing with inverses here, you're dealing with inverses using the trigonometric formulas, relationships, and ratios. One common use of the inverses is in problems that are in the form of cosine arc tangent 17 over 18. First, you use that inverse and you create a triangle, which corresponds to the given ratio. Since tangent is opposite over the adjacent, you have 17 for the opposite, 18 for the adjacent, and your goal is to figure out the third part, so you can make the cosine ratio. You figure that out, and whatever that is, you take the adjacent side and put it over that. And then, often you convert that to radians or degrees. Inverses are restricted. They fall within a given range. For three of them, arc sine, arc tangent, and arc whole secant, the range is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 or negative 90 degrees to 90 degrees. For the other three, arc cosine, arc cotangent, and arc secant, the range is 0 to pi or 0 degrees to 180 degrees. Some problems ask you to restrict or expand that range. In order to do this, with the answers you get, you add multiples of 2 pi. A problem may want you to restrict the range from 0 to 2 pi. If you have a negative answer, you need to add multiples of 2 pi to bring that to the positive point. You can graph the trigonometric function. The sine 
graph and a cosine graph are regular curves. They can vary in width, height, and location on the coordinate plane, but they're regular curves. The other four are irregular. They become undefined at some given interval. For the tangent graph, it becomes undefined at every pi over 2 or 90 degrees. The cotangent graph becomes undefined at every pi degrees. The arc the secant graph and the cosecant graph become undefined at every 2 pi or 360 degrees. Thus, these graphs start regularly and then abruptly at the given interval stop and then they start again. They start and stop, they start and stop. Like I said, sine and cosine are continuous. Trigonometry uses curves. The basic formula for a curve is y equals a sine or one of the other ratios, parentheses wt plus b. A is the amplitude, which is the height of the curve. W is the angular frequency and radius. T is the time. B is a parameter used for the initial phase. To get the phase, you divide B by W. Waves are similar to curves. In fact, the equation is very similar. Almost the same. There's two variables added. The equation for waves is y equals a sine, parentheses kx minus wt plus b. You add kx. k is the number of waves in 2 pi units. x is the location. There are several formulas associated with these waves. The wavelength is equal to 2 pi over k. Frequency is equal to W over 2 pi. The period is the inverse of the frequency or 2 pi over W. Velocity is equal to W over K or frequency times wave. Waves are used in physics and electricity, so they're very powerful use of trigonometry. Sometimes, triangles are parts of circles. When they're parts of circles, it changes. The same equations that work on a regular plane don't work here. The length of a circular sector is S equals longitude times R. The area of a circular sector is 1 half longitude R squared. That is very similar to the formula for the area of a triangle. You add the angle longitude here, though. In spherical trigonometry, you have different equations for the law of sines and cosines. Also, it's more difficult to solve your triangles in spherical trigonometry. The law of sines in spherical trigonometry is sine small a or sine big a equals sine small b or sine big b equals sine small c or sine big c. There are two formulas for the law of cosines. For sides, it's cosine small c equals cosine small a, cosine small b plus sine small a, sine small b, cosine big c. For angles, it's cosine big c equals negative cosine big a, cosine big b, plus sine big a, sine big b, cosine little c. When you graph coordinates for spherical trigonometry, you use what is called a polar plane. A rectangular plane is what you use in algebra. It's x, y. 3, 4 is a coordinate pair, for example. 3 involves going over 3 to the right and going up 4. Polar coordinates 
R, R, wanted to. R is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared longitude equals the arctangent of y over x. You can convert these the other way around. If you have the polar coordinates, you can make them in rectangular coordinates. Polar coordinates are north, south, east, west. equals r cosine longitude, y equals r sine longitude. Associated with this is also converting equations. You can convert a rectangular equation to a polar equation and vice versa. Linked to spherical trigonometry is complex numbers particularly in trigonometric form. Complex numbers are numbers involving the use of I, which represents an imaginary number. I remember studying these in algebra. I is a number that when squared equals negative one. No real number does that. In real mathematics, Positive numbers multiplied by themselves give you another positive number. A negative number multiplied by itself gives you a positive number. Because of this unique function of i, i becomes very versatile. The basic form for complex numbers in trigonometry is a plus bi equals r parentheses cosine longitude with i sine longitude. In one book, I saw it as r cis longitude. But that is not a common way to represent it, at least from what I have seen. With trigonometric form, you can perform a number of operations. You can multiply or divide. You can take the equation to given powers. You can find the roots of the equation. It's useful. At first, complex numbers intimidated me. But then I found out how awesome they can be. I really like solving problems with complex numbers. I have wondered why is trigonometry after algebra, since it really seems easier. One book said trigonometry marks a point in mathematics where you go from manipulating numbers and variables to understanding relationships. Some books describe trigonometry as the bridge between algebra manipulation to calculus relationships. Indeed, in trigonometry, oftentimes computation is less involved than in algebra. But you could probably say the relationships you need to understand to reform sometimes simple computations are more complex. Once you understand the relationships, then the computation is not that bad. If you don't understand the relationships, even if you can do the computation, you probably won't get enough of the right answers. Hopefully, I can master trigonometry and precalculus so I can go into calculus. I know that is quite the field of mathematics. Trigonometry and precalculus are challenging me a lot now, so I hope to be able to overcome that. I know it was a good decision studying trigonometry on my own. It has added a lot to my life. Good evening.